Uh, hello, happy Thursday to everyone. We are here today with a legendary Carl. Carl I don't know how to pronounce your surname, Carl. Just go for it. I just want to hear how you do it. <laughs> that is mean and evil. Come Carl, on. Carl, okay, it's, I think it's Dutch. It's Dutch origin. So yes. I would say Carl van Doysen. That's probably very correct. But here in Texas, I say Kyle van Doysen. Calvin Dusen, I like it. It yeah. sounds it sounds really posh. So we've got Carl here today with us, and I am really looking forward to this episode of the uh, Design for Geeks live talks because he is going to be talking to us about the art of copying, which I don't know if you're aware is it really, and I'm not joking, is a time honored artistic tradition. And I, I studied art history, but, you know, designers do it as well. And it is legit. And it's a very, very, very useful exercise as well. So now you can see our faces even. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. So um, Carl's here and he's a designer that I admire very, very much. We've known each other for a little while now, but just by hanging out with the same people, mostly on Facebook mm -hmm. and uh, on other WordPress related places but we share a love uh, for design and also I really admire Kyle's style but I'm particularly interested in his case and it, it's very relevant to our group because Kyle is not a designer by training neither am I and and that's what the group is aimed at so I his uh, Kyle's process to learn how to design and to become a fantastic designer someone I whose designs I look at for inspiration is a very interesting process and over to you Carl to tell us a little bit about uh, yourself well that that's an awesome introduction thank you very much I appreciate that I uh, I'm I totally have imposter syndrome all the time so the best uh, I look of at my own designs and think this is just garbage so uh, I appreciate the kind words so yeah I'm, my, my name is Kyle Van Dusen I live in Texas I own and operate Ogle Web Design which I've had for a couple years now um, we do websites and all those kinds of things. Anyways, um, so I, even from the time I was little, I always liked designing stuff. In fact, I was thinking about this interview and um, I remember going through my grandparents' house where I lived when I was real little and I found uh, where I had, I had hand designed some business cards for myself and, and stuff wow. like that. And it's just funny that it turns out I design business cards now, you know, so, uh, so for a long time, I've always liked to do that. Um, but I was very uh, unambitious in school. So as soon as I graduated high school, I thought I knew everything and I was just going to deliver pizzas and uh, be awesome that way. Um, but anyways, a, uh, a friend of mine, uh, his parents opened a sign shop in our town. And uh, it was, it was uh, something that interested me and I started going over there just to hang out. And uh, I think one day they asked me to help them, you know, take out trash and sweep floors and stuff. And, and I just started showing up day after day until they started paying me. Uh, so luckily that worked out. And uh, I got to sit behind a fantastic graphic designer. Uh, she taught me all kinds of stuff about Adobe Illustrator and got me into doing vector graphics. And that's what I did for the next 15 years was work in sign shops, doing signs and small format printing and stuff like that. So all of my education and design has just been um, watching other people do it and copying things that I like and trying to figure out how to do it for myself. So uh, eventually I basically got sick of working for somebody else, wanted to start my own business and here I am. So when, when was that? How long ago did you set up your own business? So it was, uh, I started doing some jobs on the side, like at the very end of 2016. And then in 2017, uh, I started the business and like June of 2017, I quit my full-time job and started doing this full-time. That's fantastic. But let me just ask you something else, because from your description, it sounds as if you didn't really um, do websites before, whereas I know you as someone who's very qualified and competent dealing with WordPress websites. So when did you learn all about that? I mean, so the first, the first WordPress website I made was in December of 2016. Right. So that was the first time I had done it. Back in high school, we, we I took like a, a webmaster class and we did some like really basic HTML stuff. This is like, you, you know, the year 2000. So, uh, 
you know, I could do some really basic HTML stuff then, um, but then I didn't do anything from then until 2016. Uh, and that was the first time I opened WordPress and, and just dug into online tutorials and videos and started figuring it out. I am seriously impressed because it took me a hell of a lot longer to learn WordPress. My brain was refusing to compute, but so yes, I am extremely impressed with that. That's amazing. Well, amazing. I still got a long ways to go. I'm still faking it till I make it. Yeah, but you're faking it really well because you completely took me in. If so, <laughs> <magic>. <laughs> but anyway, you're uh, well. Uh, also, Kyle runs a, a great. Uh, group i mean here in design for geeks we are very much tool agnostic so there could uh, we discuss design issues we don't really talk about tools at all so uh, but we a lot of us are from a Word, wordpress background just because i have so many friends in the uh uh in that kind of um what's the word in that kind of world in the wordpress sure. community so it's that, that's why but however that's um Kyle has a fantastic, uh, mainly WordPress related group called the Admin Bar. But we, we talk about business a lot as well in there, don't we? It's, it's WordPress, but it's also helping each other out with sort of business issues. It's it's quite a wide ranging and very, very helpful group. And I, and I love it. So not all of the geeks work with WordPress. But if some of you do and you haven't joined the Admin Bar yet, you should do because also uh, Carl does l fantastic lives. Uh, so yes, um, yes. So um, uh, I, I, I will mention it. It is uh, me and my buddy Matt Siebert started it together, yeah. um, basically because we started discussing all the details about our business um, and all the back end stuff, front end stuff, all of it. You know, and we're like, man, we really got to take this to more people because we benefited from it so much, from it so much. So you're right. It is. It is WordPress focused. Uh, but it's a lot about just running your own, you know, design agency. So, yeah, if anybody wants to join, we'd love to have you. Yes, please. And I immediately also love the fact that there was such a, there is a design angle because you are designers and Matt is also an illustrator, isn't he? So it's much more yeah. visual. And that's the thing about the WordPress community. Often design isn't talked about at all, which is also why I started all this, because I realized that there was a real need to talk about that because, uh, WordPress is mainly made of developers. Now it's it's start now it's changing. It's definitely changing. Also thanks to the page builders, but uh, talking about design is is really important. So anyway, yes. So we all had uh, all of us who are not trained designers who find ourselves being professional designers. And I I actually don't have the impos imposter syndrome anymore because I have been doing it long enough. I have it on a you know a whole range of other issues and I, I keep it. I think the imposter syndrome is really important to have because only people who know they don't know enough have it. I mean, st sorry, stupid people don't have it. You know, some of us are even right. sort of in, uh, in, um, in um, important uh, positions, you know, um, in uh, the higher ranges of government is often full of people that don't have imposter syndrome and really should have it. Because basically right. having imposter syndrome means that you keep working, you keep studying, you keep improving yourself because you realize that you may get something really uh, well, but you need to always keep learning. So I keep it. Uh, I'm fine with calling myself a designer, but I keep learning absolutely never stop. And I think that's what it what why it's great. I lo always like people who say they have the imposter syndrome because I'm like, yeah, you're one of us. We right. yeah, we have a si similar outlook. So, yes, it's always interesting to see what techniques we used to learn uh, to become designers. And I think they're copying is a great one but it sure as how it takes longer i think <laughs> but it's a it's a it's a viable technique i mean copying is what artists did you know when when you were um in an artist's uh studio as an apprentice you were set you were you know sat there copying you know they, they you were made to copy stuff and that's how you and that's how you learn yeah, yeah. for sure so you know i think Part of it is, is, is there, there's been, everything's been designed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Can you really make something completely original anymore that doesn't have any influence from anywhere? The chances are, unless you're from another planet, you just, 
you can't help but be influenced by something all the time. So you're always going to be doing some level of copying no matter what, you know. Uh, it's just kind of the way things are. So I think the, the if you can look at it the right way, you can actually benefit from that a whole lot, you know. So uh, where I've gained a lot from copying is because I don't have that education in design and you know like you said you didn't go to school to be a designer but art history but you still have all this vocabulary that i don't yeah, have so absolutely you can look at something and explain it in a way um that i can't do so i look at something and say that looks good or i don't like the way that looks and that's like mm -hmm. almost the limit of my vocabulary on it and that's something that any kind of trained designer is going to have over me because they can articulate those things they can spot those things and know why something looks good and for any of us that aren't classically trained in design, that's a whole lot harder for us to do. So what copying yeah. does is it forces you to really look at all these details. So one of the um, one of the examples I give uh, a lot when I've talked about this, especially in kind of website work, is one of the biggest mistakes you see people make, and I'll, I'll bet you agree with this, is people that aren't designers make is not leaving not leaving enough negative space and white space in their designs and everything's like real crammed together and you know when you learn about design you learn that the negative space is just as important as anything you put on the page or even more so, important yeah sometimes. exactly so i think one thing you learn and the example that i've used a lot is um you let's say that this is kind of my workflow or how I've done it in the past is I'll find a page that I think is beautiful and maybe I don't know why I just really am attracted to this page and I'll put it in one window and put my uh, Elementor in another window and I'm going to start trying to copy it you know and one thing you learn really quickly is you know maybe I usually put 50 pixels of padding around a section and I'm looking at this beautiful website and I realize it has 150 pixels around it. And I would have never like just put in 150 pixels because it seems crazy. Uh, but what you learn by forcing yourself to copy these things um, is all these details of why or what makes these designs look good, which I think is super helpful. Yeah, very, very helpful. I think that also because one of my mantras or one of my mottos uh, is also that good design is is good marketing as well and i think that when you work with good marketing you understand why certain messages need to be you know to stand out more because it's um because uh, i've actually forgotten the point i was about to make <laughs> which is the beauty of lives um yes um i was just saying how design and marketing work well together because when you design websites you do marketing much more than you did when you were doing printed stuff i don't know if you feel mm -hmm. the same because my print yeah. background is different from yours but i think that the marketing aspect is much much stronger for us web designers than it ever was in print or you know um when getting things printed the the outlook was completely different the the aims were completely different it was very difficult to measure anything as well so sure. you were a bit more relaxed about it because whereas now it is measurable if you don't get any results you will know so you will be able to know exactly how many people have clicked on your call to action if no one does then you have a problem so that's why design to me is even more important now and few but still not enough people do it as a par for the course thing especially those of us who are not very big you know people who have you know are a one-man band they just build websites because they have the ability but they don't spend enough time thinking about the design which is why uh you know i was really impressed that you absolutely do and the thing is you sort of talk yourself down for being unable to know what makes a design good but then that's why i am so impressed because if you do it mostly instinctively that means that you have a huge eye for design much better than a lot of designers that i see around that actually did go to school but are not as effective as someone like you so well i think i think that's something that you hear too is like you know uh some people like just have an eye for design or whatever and i think there's 
that is true in some cases and some people are just naturally drawn to one thing or the other or naturally good at something uh you know i have uh two kids that aren't far apart in age and one of them's really good at one thing and one of them's really good at the other and that's just kind of how things are so i think you can be kind of naturally inclined to do design but i don't think that i necessarily was i think i spent a lot of time uh, learning how to do it and the good part about that is anybody who's sitting out here watching this is like you can absolutely, absolutely. learn to design it's not something you were you have to be born with like you I, I can't pick up a pencil and draw anything and i think it would take me uh, a million years to learn how to like sketch something really beautiful because i just can't do it but on a computer doing graphic design you can absolutely anybody can learn how to do it if you want to do it and you want to put in the time you don't have to be born with I completely agree with this, and that's actually the, 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 it's the complete point for of design for geeks. Because the point is that yes, it can be learned, and especially web design, you don't need to be artistic or to do anything conceptual. You know, to do conceptual art to to build great websites that work and that uh, that convert, especially and that are well designed. That's that is completely my line of thinking as well. So. Tell us a bit more about the copying then, because it's it's really interesting then how you choose what to copy. So when you find a website that you think looks great, what usually makes you think that? What do you go for? Yeah, I mean, uh, part of this is just going to be your personal opinion, you know. So there is there is some subjectiveness to things that are well designed and things that aren't, and there's. There's some things that aren't subjective about it. There's some things that are just fact that this is uh, well designed and this is not. But yeah, I agree you know, with that. I, I spend a lot of time looking at websites. I spend a lot of time looking at all kinds of things that are designed. You know, uh, we get a new package from the grocery store, and I'm looking at how they design that, or I'm driving down the road and I see a billboard, and I'm seeing how they design that. So, you know, when you get into it, you start seeing design in everything. You know, so I think uh, part of it is just kind of like taking mental pictures of things, saving those things for inspiration, literally taking screenshots, looking at Pinterest, yeah. saving things and saying, okay, how can I incorporate this into what I do? Um, you know, starting when I started doing this and I was doing, you know, print stuff, I, I would literally, you know, find somebody's business card that was beautiful and try to make one exactly like it, not for production, not to not to sell or anything like that. Uh, you know, obviously we don't want to copy somebody's intellectual property and, and reuse it. Yeah. So that's not what we're talking about today, but uh, to, to start learning about it because you start learning about things like balance. So um, if you went to art school, you would probably spend all kinds of time talking about, you know, uh, how important balance is. But if you just open up Elementor and say, I'm going to design websites now, that's probably not a term you're very familiar with and you don't understand how that works. Um, but what you might find is when you find a website that you really like and you start copying it, you realize how, uh, how there's symmetry or balance or different things anchoring different parts of the design together that make that pleasing to the eye. Um, so I think a lot of it is just really forcing yourself to examine why you like something or why something looks attractive to you. Yeah, that's, I think that's exactly the point. And also why something, why a design works while another design may not work that well, I think is another thing that will probably make you reflect. And um, sure. uh, also um, I think a very useful exercise is to look at the websites of big people who definitely know how to do it. And actually, they're always the simplest ones, aren't they? Like, for instance, yeah. the Apple website is probably the simplest website on earth. It's so simple. Sometimes, I mean, mind you, I'm not even sure whether they are a, the right example because they are beyond. I mean, they 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 may they they could function without a website. They're not even you know. So sure. maybe their um, their design is not the uh, most relevant example. But looking at people who are clearly very successful online is very interesting. And w yes. It's, it's funny you say that though about like really simplistic things because that's what you'll hear a lot of people who aren't designers say. They'll say, they'll see something like that and say, well, you know, anybody could do that. <laughs> I challenge you because uh, designing something that 
is balanced and uh, is proportioned correctly and all that, but keeping it down to the most simple uh, points possible is the hardest thing to do. It would be way easier for me to get in Photoshop and use every filter and do every effect and put in 500 photos. That's way easier than like really taking everything away until you have the most minimal layout possible. That's, that's by far, I think, the hardest thing to do in design. I completely agree. And it's the hardest thing to get a client to understand because they'll see something that's very, very simple. So they'll say, oh, well, that took you five minutes to do. It's like, no, well, it took me 20 years of doing the job working in the profession, number one. And number two, what you do is you design and then you take off, you take off, you take off, you take off until only, only the essential remains. And it's the hardest thing because it takes courage. It takes real bravery to yeah. do something that is as simple as possible. But I am going, I am actually more and more uh, liking that. I want to strip everything back and have as little as possible. I'm going through this kind of phase at the moment where the simpler the, 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 simpler, the better, but it's not that easy to get clients to sign up for that. So we yeah. have our own projects. We can do that on our own projects, you know, so that helps. Yeah, you yeah. know, and I'll usually just explain to customers when that kind of situation happens too is, is you know, especially with website stuff, so you're talking about how the marketing plays a big part of it, is, you know, our goal here isn't to impress any of your customers with fancy design. Like, uh, you're a plumber. Like, your customers don't give a shit about that at uh, all. Like, they want you to come fix the leak they have, you know. So uh, we're trying to make this as easy as possible for them to navigate to what they need to find on your website, you know. So overcomplicating things, sure, I'll, I can do it for you, but you're going to see less results from that, you know. So I think a lot of times you can kind of work those things out with clients, although it does take a little bit more uh, time and explaining uh, because, you know, I, I don't expect Joe the plumber to understand, you know, design principles either. No, but um, one interesting thing that I wanted to ask you is that if you worked with signs, you had a very limited amount of space to um, very limited and restricted amount of mm -hmm. space to work with. One of the things that I found difficult when transitioning to the web from print, I used to do books a lot and then I worked for cinema. So I did uh, posters uh, for a long time. So that meant that I knew exactly the size of what I had to design. What I find challenging with websites, I think is great, but it's also really challenging, is that the real estate that you have is so much more and a page is potentially infinite. It can just scroll down forever. So personally, I find that keeping to a design system on a website is actually much more difficult. And I am making myself now, when the project allows it, actually start with the system and then get designing because otherwise you find yourself with pages that don't look the same and you keep sort of adjusting, tweaking and so on. So, but because you came, you know, I came from books and then posters or magazines and things like that. Whereas you had an even more restricted, how, how did you feel with the web page, with the potential infinity of the web page? Yeah, the I mean, there's not space. only like the length of the web page, there's now we're dealing with, the uh, there's an infinite number of monitors and screen yeah, sizes yeah. and devices and everything. So yeah, it's uh, that's definitely something you have to like wrap your head around if you come from print and go into web stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think my first, uh, my first go at that was um, using websites that had containers, you know, so they weren't anything full width because that just felt better to my brain is like, okay, I know this is 1300 pixels wide and it's never going to be any wider. Okay. So that like helps my brain a little bit. Um, but then just having the different breakpoints for tablets and mobile devices and stuff like that. I think luckily the, the page builders, which I use page builders because I'm I'm not a developer. Um, so if it weren't for page builders, I wouldn't be doing this. But the page builders do such a good job now of giving you all those breakpoints. Um, you know, you can scale your browser in and out to try to get some ideas of things. But that's still something that I, I struggle with because, yes, my mindset is back in Adobe Illustrator where, you know, I have an artboard and it's a specific size and that's it, you know. 
Um, so that's that's a challenge for sure. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is like how images will like backgrounds will scale and stuff like that depending on the size of the device. I think it's just something you got to play with until it kind of makes sense in your brain. Again, it's something that's hard for me to like articulate how it works, you know? Yeah. It's something more that I've just figured out by beating my head against a wall doing it. Yeah. I have to say that sometimes I really feel nostalgia for the days of getting books printed because designing books to be printed, it was so much easier. You, right. you know, the the knowledge required was much much less. You always had the printers you can speak you could speak to if you weren't sure. And once something was done, it was done. It was terrifying because then a, a big mistake in print is very difficult to correct. So I used to think, yeah. oh, if I only worked on the web, it wouldn't be such a problem to get a misprint of of sorts or you know, color right. coming out wrong. Uh, but now, I'm looking back, thinking, oh, it was so much easier. There were I had to know so uh you know really fewer fewer details to think about and then when a job was done it was done like you know it was done where whereas it's also it it's it's also the good side to websites that they're never done because then we get keep we keep getting work out of the same client so so that's it's much nicer whereas if someone does a book they've done the book that's it but yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, it's kind of like if you use that book comparison, it's almost uh, doing websites is almost like if you were doing a book, but they also wanted you to uh, tell people why they were getting the book, uh, what the pages were going to be made <laughs> out of, how it was going to be printed, what inks we were going to use, like uh, how it was going to be shipped. I mean, that's literally yeah. all the things we're doing with the website because we're having to hook up all this tech as well, you know, and worry about servers and deliverability of emails and all these other kinds of things that don't go into all that print stuff. So yeah, uh, it is a lot more complex, but I definitely feel a lot better when a uh, website customer emails me and says something's misspelled than when it's a print customer. Yes, without a doubt. Absolutely. Without a doubt. So in terms of um, design again, so what time did we start? We started a little bit later. We've got another good 10 minutes. So um, when you start planning a website, how do you approach the design of a website? Because one thing that I find happens very often, often with small budget clients, I'm not assuming that you only work with small budget clients because I know that you have bigger clients as well. But it often happens, even with bigger clients, that they don't have the branding together. They don't understand that they need, they they will often have a logo, but they don't have any guidelines, they don't have anything. So on top of the problem of approaching uh, the the structure and, you know, planning the layout of a website, often there's a further problem on top that you need to work out what the branding is. So how do you approach that kind of problem? So let's say that a client without a brand branding guidelines comes to you and wants a website. How do you, and you get the job and you start designing it. How do you approach it? Well, I think luckily for me, I did a lot of that kind of work in the sign shop. So uh, I dealt with people's brand standards. We built some for people. So, um, you know, it, you know, I want to use SVGs and websites as much as possible because I love vector artwork and the files are tiny and all that. So, you know, I'll always grab my customer's logo. If they don't have a vector one, that's not a real big deal to me because I'll just open up Illustrator and, you know, create it vector and then boom, I can use it on their website and stuff. So I'm probably kind of a unique case for that. um, In that, You know, I'll, I'll just use my own judgment if they don't have brand standards as far as, um, what I think would work. Um, you know, if that, if I can use that as an upsell with the client and say, Hey, you know, really, I don't have anything to go off of. Why don't we start one step backwards and kind of talk about your brand a little bit, um, before we jump into making a website so we can make sure that you're consistent, you know, at every touch, every customer touch point, let's make sure everything's consistent and kind of audit all those things. But, uh, you know, with a small budget client, that's, that's a pie in the sky. That's not going to really happen. So for me, I'll, I'll just kind of rely on those principles of, uh, let's sample colors from their logo and let's make sure that that's the palette we're using for the website. You know, uh, uh, if there's, you know, typography within their logo, okay, what's going to match well with that? So uh, because I've done this for a long time, I can usually see a font and tell you what it is because we just get nerdy like that after a while uh, and take pride in, in, 
not having to use what the font and all that to Never. figure out a font. Uh, so yeah, uh, so you know, just trying to stick with things that are going to complement their brand without without having to go in and do all that strategy because you know honestly i don't want to do a whole lot of that with customers because it's so time consuming it's hard to convince local businesses that there's yeah. value in that or they could get any return out of that so you know i'll just try to go back to the the basics on that and make sure we can do something that that looks nice and fits well with what they have i'm just checking if there are any comments because i don't see any on on the on the desktop but there might be because facebook is not great like that anyway Yes, the correct the correct approach would be to go to them and say, look, how about you invest, you know, $1,000 in very simple branding guidelines. Sometimes they go for it, sometimes they don't. I have had success in persuading them just by saying, you, it's going to save you so much money in the future. You do need it. But funnily enough, just exactly that thing happened to me with a current client whose website I am about, I'm about to launch after this. And they um, don't have guidelines. And that's exactly what I did. I took a color from the logo and said, we're going to use this for the active buttons. And we're going to use a darker version of that color for uh, another type of active button. And this is, you know, and then I kept everything really neutral. And that worked. Sure. But what was lucky was that they just said, yeah, that's great. What can happen is that they go, no, I don't like that. And, and because we didn't discuss it, then that's a, a situation where scope creep can so easily come in, which is sure. why it would be so useful to, to mind you, you know, like I said, I just comes from a situation where I didn't do it and it's worked out well, but it is, it is dangerous. And actually guidelines make complete sense because then you have it, it's done and you know what to do. And it's a way of keeping design consistent. So, uh, yeah, it would be good to get everyone to do it. Yeah, and usually yeah. what I'll do with customers like that, if we if we don't have, you know, if it's a completely new website, I mean, even on a redesign, if we're doing something completely different, I'll usually put together my idea for the design, be that maybe in Illustrator where I'm most comfortable, I can throw something together pretty quickly, you know, stylistic-wise, like we're going to use these colors, you know, I have this idea to, as a kind of treatment to photos or whatever it might be to give this the website kind of a unique look. Uh, or now, most of the time, I'm just doing it straight into the browser because uh, yeah. Elementor is damn near Photoshop at this point anyways. I know. Um, so... Um, you know, I'll usually give them some kind of preview of, okay, this is kind of what I have for an idea. Can I get your approval on this, you know, as a concept, like this isn't a finished product or anything, but this is a concept. And then from there, my, you know, what I try to do and, and without being arrogant, but at the same time, like you hired me to design this website. So let me design it, you know, Joe, the plumber, when you come over to fix my pipes, I don't start telling you how to do your job. Like, I hired you to do it because I know you know what you're doing. So, you know, back off a little bit and let me handle this for you. You know, and you, you of course have to do that nice, nicely. Um, I, I don't get to be the, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Chris Doe, but he's one of those guys yeah, that would just tell I people do. exactly how it's going to happen, you know. Uh, yeah. So I don't quite go that far, but, um, you know, at some point you've got to get to where your customers trust in what you're doing, you know, and I think part of that just comes with time. Uh, time served and getting some confidence and being able to produce some results so you can say, hey, listen, you know, you hired me to do this and this is uh, what I know from my experience is going to give you the best results. So um, that can be difficult. That's why that's one of the reasons why I encourage and recommend that people who want, don't have design training actually do learn a little bit about design, because if you have reasons behind your choices, then your argument with your clients is going to be that much stronger. It's like, for right. instance, if you're able to tell them, well, no, I cannot make the logo bigger because that would make it be too close to the rest of the navigation. And according to the laws of Gestalt uh, vision, psychology of vision, that's going to make the brains of your customers work too hard to find your menu. And ultimately, they will not buy your stuff because they won't be able to see the menu as clearly. Something like this. It's not probably a very yeah, good example, great. but this is so that's kind of why, you know, when I give talks on on uh, on this kind of subject or in the courses that I've uh, done, that's the kind of thing that I think is really important to understand. It's not 
that you need necessarily to be a trained designer, but it will make you that much stronger and it will m make it your, uh, I, I don't want to say win, but with a client, you do need to give them reasons. And basically that's what design is. Design is solving a problem and it's never down to personal taste. So if you don't want your client to use a red button, you better be able to tell them why it shouldn't be red. Because otherwise you just like them. It's just like going, oh no, well, I don't like that, which is exactly what clients do. So you need to be able right. to say, no, red is not the right, right color for this because first of all, it's a stop color um, and people tend not to click on a red button because red is the color of, you know, don't go any further or it's the color of danger. Or perhaps you could, you might be able to say, well, people who have a problem with red won't be able to see the contrast clearly. So, you know, and that means knowing a little bit about design. So that's why I think in that sense, knowledge is power. But having said all this, you can be, you can design without being a trained designer, as we've said. I'd like yeah, to... Yeah, sorry. Go no, no, if you go, go on. So, yeah, I think that's one of the other things you learn kind of going back to copying is when yeah. you start uh, copying pages or whatever kind of design that you think looks really good, you're going to start picking up on those things without even really realizing it, you know? So you're going to start looking at color palettes and, and font sizes and all that, and you're going to start realizing that... Uh, this site, this site, and this site that you really like, while they look completely different, they have all these things in common. You yeah. know, they're using these two contrasting colors, or they're not using six different fonts on the same website. They stuck to two, it's and that was one. it. You know, yeah. there's no reason for any more than that. So you kind of like start to learn those, you know, those are some basic principles of design, but they're really important things. And, you know, that's something that if you're just starting out, you might go, oh my God, a thousand fonts, I'm going to use all of them. Yeah, uh, so exciting. Which, which, yeah, or, or like with animation. Really is you don't yeah. want to do that. No, and it's like with animation, just because uh, it's so easy to get things to animate with Divi or with Elementor or with Beaver Builder, and then everybody's animating. But in terms right. of back to copying, which is, I think, a totally fascinating subject. But whenever I want to, I mean, I have various, I, I, I'm sure we all have our sort of in, inspiration sources. But one thing that I find always works when I'm not sure how to do things, I look at how newspapers do them. Newspapers, online newspapers, obviously, that I know are doing things really well. The reason why is because they really know how to treat typography. And typography really still is the vast majority of what happens on a web page. Even with the um, certain... The, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm talking in, in like three different languages at the moment So I, I, of work things. So when I just gave a talk yesterday in Spanish, so I'm just getting, I can't find the, and I couldn't find the words yesterday. So it was right. cra crap and now it's crap because I can't find the words in English. Well done. So uh, now with the uh, video is sort of uh, prevalent these days, but even so, I think 90, if not 95% of the web is actually still written word. So typography is absolutely paramount and essential. And the reason why newspaper articles are very interesting to look at is because they need to uh, have a really clear structure and they have a lot of information and a lot of different details that they need to make sure that people understand clearly at first sight. So it's always a great way. And it's interesting how, in fact, most newspapers only use one typeface, one typeface mm -hmm. and different fonts, because not, I don't know, uh, not, um, well, those of us who are designers might know that, will obviously know the difference between a typeface and a font. But in case you don't, a typeface is a family of fonts. So if, for instance, if you use Brandon Grotesque as your typeface, then it will have a bold version, a black version, a, you know, it's your various 100, 700, 500 weight, the italic version, the, the Roman version and so on. Those, every single different instance of a typeface is a font. So that's the difference between a typeface and a font. So if you have one typeface on your website, you may use maybe three fonts because you will need a bold, you will need an italic and you will need a, a Roman, a, a sort of normal. Um, but 
yes, back to, to, to then, you know, the copying. So when I do copy, I always go and see how simply certain newspapers do it. And now we're starting to see also newspapers that actually have quite bold layouts because mm -hmm. a lot of the sort of commercial websites, so to speak, you tend to use always the same boring layouts. So if you keep copying the websites that have centered uh, hero uh, sections, the web just, is just going to look all the same. So I think that w when we copy, we should really go far and wide and try to find new things all the time. I like to go when I'm in a copying mood, I like to go to the awards, various awards websites, uh, you, you know, the websites that uh, showcase all the award-winning websites and a lot of them are absolutely appalling because while they show a lot of creativity they also uh, use all the wrong things for accessibility and usability and basically they're unusable and un unaccessible to most people but it is int yeah uh, so that's a whole different talk that I'm sure we'll have one day but I, I, I don't want to I sort of refrain from doing the let's have a feast at the expense of the awards website because it's just horrible to do that to anybody's work because also well my own work could be destroyed just as easily and uh you know you'd never know the constraints you know maybe someone really didn't want to do that and the clients forced them so i i, I won't do that but basically it is interesting though because you do have to push yourself a little bit and there's always someone who's done something that you hadn't thought about because also the, the technical restrictions on the web do play a part and the accessibility and things like that. So I think that the interesting challenge is to create bold, unusual designs that are also usable and accessible. But yes, it's, yeah. and I don't know how I got there from talking about newspapers, which in fact are totally, ordered. sorry, I just, I rambled. I, I went well, off. I do have ramble. a couple points that I think are little tips, I think that could help people out. So yes. one is, um, there's, there's, there might be millions of typefaces and fonts, but there's only a few good ones. Like yes. there's a very short list of good typefaces yeah. out there. So, uh, I'm sure you could give people a list. I could give people a list off my head, uh, off the top of my head, but really you need to find a few fonts that work really well. You need something that's serif, something that's sans serif, you know, so you need a little catalog of fonts and just let those be your go-to. You don't need to try to use a new font for every website you create. Like, get to the basic ones, and those are the ones that are gonna work on every site. Uh, so I would stick with something like that. There's lots of good sites that will show you uh, how different fonts pair well together, and for the most part, I find that those work pretty well. Some of them where they give you a million options, it's just too much, but, um, you know, learning kind of which ones pair nice, and you can reuse that on sites. I think when I first started building websites, I felt like every website I was going to make needed to be completely unique and something I I hadn't done before. And what I quickly realized is uh, that's not really a good business move. Like that's very time consuming, and I'm not going to make a whole lot of money. But also, you know, I have a style now. You know, so you might see three or four of my three or four of my websites and go, okay, now I'm kind of seeing what Kyle does, you know, and my style is a mix of a bunch of other people's styles that I liked and kind of smooshed together. So eventually, while the first few sites you make might be completely different, eventually you're going to start finding things that you kind of repeat over and over. Now you can make them varying enough where one website isn't a clone from the other and I don't save templates out of one site and bring them into a new site because that just bothers me. Uh, I'd rather just recreate the whole thing again. I don't know why. That's probably just my brain. It uh, is a bit. You, you start to learn like things that are your style and things that you know work well every time and keep those in your toolbox because you need to pull those out. If you know they work every time, then use them, you know? Uh, so I think things like fonts, things like color combinations, uh, those are things that you can kind of save and use over and over again and kind of apply them in new ways. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And I can guarantee that you can create websites that look completely different, always using the same font. I can guarantee oh, sure. that that's the case. And um, any brand... I'm down to about five fonts that I use on websites now, and that's it. Yeah. So all the various my fonts, Creative Market, all the 
fonts that people buy when you hear people saying oh i bought this font can i use it on my website I'm like no you can't because it won't be as good and i show you what i mean by a font being good this is not good enough no you right so yes i could not agree more this is a really important thing and it's back down to saying what we were saying earlier that the simpler a design the better and actually i found myself saying last night because i was doing this talk um at my local wordpress meetup that in fact when i was a print designer i felt very restrictive when i had to work on the web I, I sort of moved to the web quite late not not very long ago at all but one of the reasons why i wasn't that interested uh or in working on the web was that i felt that there was too much typographical restriction and i thought it was horrible that i had to use system fonts and arial and you know and always have a row with developers about it and so on so but then i find myself thinking yesterday and saying that actually that was my limitation and my mistake because i should have been able to create a great website in Arial. really that you should if Arial is all you've got you are going to make a beautiful website if you have or, or not just beautiful usable accessible and that converts these are the things right. that matter before before it's beautiful it needs to be these three things so you could, you know, with, I, I hope I never, it never comes to that. I hope I never ever have to design a website with Arial only as my option because- It's better than having to design it with just Comic Sans though. I knew you'd say that. I knew you'd say that. And I thank you for saying that. Okay. And I tell you what, a friend, um, Corey Dodd, who's a, yeah. another fantastic designer. He uh, tweeted, I just noticed his a tweet of his that said, um, Montserrat, you know, the, the Google font, mm -hmm. uh, the new Comic Sans. And I was like, yes, I agree, because Montserrat is a ubiquitous font. A lot of people use it because it looks a little bit like, uh, uh, like uh, Gotham, you know, which is a really good font, uh, but it's not. And it's everywhere, and it's, it's just a font that looks wrong in many. And pe everybody uses it, and he said, the new Comic Sans, and I was like, that's such yeah. a brilliant, brilliant thing I have to, to admit, say. I'm, I'm guilty of using it some too, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's like to the point now where it's just so overused everywhere. Yeah. So yeah. So that's I'll admit my guilt on that one. <laughs> I pro I've used it. It's fine. I've used it. Of course I have. Everyone. And also when he came out, it was lovely. It was like, oh my God, look, we have a font that looks that is it looks like uh new trophies as well some other really nice fonts that i used to sans serif fonts i used to love anyway so um i think we uh can say our final words on copying was there any other important point that you felt was uh necessary to make about the time honored art of copying Still yeah, like an uh, artist, Matt was saying. Still like an artist, definitely. There's lots of great quotes about copying from a lot of different artists, which I should actually have prepared, but I didn't. So I don't know why well, I said I think, it. Uh, <laughs> I think sometimes when you, when you feel like you're doing something creative, you feel like it should be original. And it, like I said before, there's, there's not really many things left that are just completely original. We've all pulled inspiration from somewhere before, so there's really no shame in taking no. inspiration from things uh, and making it your own. And the only way you're really going to get better at doing that is, you know, by practicing doing it, you know. So I would never encourage somebody to take somebody's layout verbatim and then put it into your own website. Uh, and I don't think any of us would advocate for that. But I guarantee there's sections on my website that look very similar to a section on another website. And it's the same with yours and it's the same with every website on the internet because there's some things that just work and, and we all kind of repeat them. So uh, I don't think there's any shame in doing right. that. You can just start focusing on some of the details of why those things look good. You know, you can make a three column section look good and you can make a three column section look terrible. So what, why is that? What's the difference between the, the really good looking one and the really terrible looking one? And I think by you copying the really good looking ones, you're going to start to understand some of those things. Yes, I think that's fantastic advice. Absolutely. And one that I follow myself without a doubt. As we keep learning, because web design never is a never, never ending um, 
quest to learn everything there is to know about it, which is a lot. So I don't know if in a light time I'll manage to, to fit it all in. But uh, yes, so uh, if there were any other comments, I will never know because um, basically I will know, but only after this live is finished. So okay, well, if anybody has questions, tag me in it. I'm, I'm always around. I'll be glad to answer anything I can. Yes, exactly. And uh, again, Carol and Matt's group, the admin bar, absolutely great to talk not only about WordPress, but also about business. So uh, yes, do uh, join it. And um, yes, I think this will be all then. Thank you so much for everyone who was here with us and we'll see you again soon. And thank you so much, Kyle. Um, Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. An absolute pleasure, pleasure. Thank you so much. And now the awkward moment where I think I'm stopping streaming and hopefully I really am. <laughs> bye bye everyone. Bye, bye.